welcome to The Functional Code, your go-to source for decoding optimal health. Join Dr. Addy and Dr. Jace as they break down the science behind pain, performance, longevity, and more, making complex concepts easy for you to understand and apply in your life. Your journey to a healthier you begins with understanding The Functional Code. Disclaimer, the content provided in this health podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast is solely at your own risk. The creators and hosts of this podcast are not responsible for any actions or decisions you may take based on the information presented. Welcome back to The Functional Code. We're on episode, gosh, I believe, what, 13? 13. Uh, Today, we're going to be covering a topic on chiropractic. We're going into a lot of other things, history, adjustments. We're going into a bunch of other small nitty-gritty details, but also so you as the public have a good idea and understanding of where we think we're at, where we think we're going, and then some of our different philosophies as we go through. So again, I'm Dr. Jace. I am Dr. Addy, and we got a great podcast for you. Just even a little bit of conversations that Doc and I have been doing before we started Mm it already been giving us goosebumps because I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be very raw. Yep. It's going to be, I would say it's going to be, it's going to be unfiltered and it's going to be information that I think too many times professions are afraid to talk about themselves in a way that make them look a certain way. And I think Doc and I have done just so much training and we, we are to the point now where We're not afraid to speak on the weaknesses, not only the strengths of what we do, but the weaknesses Mm -hmm. of what we do. It's only going to improve our profession in the long run. You're about to hear all of that today Mm -hmm. in this podcast. It is quite amazing the things that we have been able to see as chiropractors and those that we've worked with. And I think you're going to get to see, uh, uh, get to hear a lot of, of what we've been able to do, where we need to grow, and some of the the nitty gritty details in between. So thank you for everyone that's listening in, watching. We're excited to bring that to you today. Mm -hmm. We're going to start today off with philosophy of what we do. Doc, I know each chiropractic professional is a little different when it comes to philosophy, but in your own words, how would you sum up what you believe in chiropractic and what we do? I think you can almost see it from the results. And I think it'd be wise to go back to like, for like my understanding, going back to how I got integrated into what chiropractic yeah. is. And I think understanding or have the audience understand kind of like where we were in our understanding even before we went to chiropractic school, yeah. then chiro school, and then to right now. So early on, I got checked in hockey. I was like 10 years old, laying on my tailbone. Mm-hmm. I had to sit on a cone, quite honestly, went to the medical doctor. They didn't help. Went to a chiropractor after a few adjustments helped. And then even going fast forward, I had general maintenance as I went through high school. And there's times to where I I knew I wanted to spend time working on the body. I was definitely active. Didn't know what that looked like. Um, After going through undergrad school, there's opportunities for physical therapy, for chiropractic. And with my past experience, chiropractic, it made sense. Uh, for that ambition, but I still had more of like an entrepreneur mindset mm-hmm. of running a business, of having it done in a, in a certain way that that can make a difference long term for my kids and the kids' kids growing up. Yeah. And I think now we're to a point where we're documenting that. So as we went through chiropractic school, I was fascinated with how. There's so many different techniques, which you know, we're going to get to in a sec, but on how many different ways that you can go about chiropractic. And so I went through most every club at least once to get a general understanding um, and then start to put the pieces together through the school. And then after school, got the chance to visit slash assess over like 80 different clinics mm-hmm. throughout multiple states, chiropractic, physical therapy. Um, general medicine there's there's a lot of 
clinics and ways that people, professionals and practitioners go about and looking at how they treat others in the public. And that gave me a good understanding of, okay, so I think I know I want to go down this pathway. This is how I want my practice to look. I'm still curious, still want to keep adding in, but my, like my mindset is if we're not growing, we're definitely stagnating. Yeah. And even through that, get a chance to work with almost like a multidisciplinary clinic, probably not to the extent that you, you did, but we had like physical therapists, we had massage therapists, yep. chiropractors, worked at a practice in Minnesota for about a year and then moved down and started up with AFC and mm-hmm. now here we are from yeah. there. So I guess, Doc, how does your background look? What's your, and we can dive into philosophy as well, but yeah. yeah. So I did have an experience like sort of like yourself. It wasn't mm-hmm. to me, but it was to my mom. And mm-hmm. she was dealing with migraines all throughout her life. And the only person, in my opinion, who I would see change, she would see change with, it wasn't the Aleve bottle. It wasn't the mm-hmm. Tylenol bottle. It wasn't anything like that. It was the chiropractor, the local chiropractor. And seeing that from an early age, I wanted to make an impact on not only my mom, because seeing someone close to you who you care about suffer the way that she did, you already want to make sure that doesn't happen to other people you, you love. So mm-hmm. I really got into the mindset of wanting to help people with chiropractic early on from, from that standpoint. But even through, you know, as I grew up, even towards undergrad, I, I didn't like the idea of medicine. I ran from the flu vaccine. I hated it. <laughs> My family always tried to make me get it. I never wanted it. It was always a fight. I, Why know, is that? I just felt something inside of me say that this mm-hmm. wasn't natural or good. I didn't want that. And I, ever since I was young too, I always picked out things that other people did to like mass wise that just didn't question it. And I always liked to question things. I'm a thinker. I, I love talking about why I want to make sure that before I do something, I... Hi, <laughs> Hi. Bye, me. And we do have guests, one mm-hmm. of which is wanting to go on our lap. <laughs> hey, you going to go lay down? Come here, bud. You can come here. Come here. Come on. Fine. Come here. Up. Fine. <laughs> Sit. There, there you go. That's awesome. Cool. <laughs> but yeah, even growing up, I felt just this... Always, I, I, was a th- I'm a th- I always felt like I was a thinker. I wanted mm-hmm. to know why. I didn't just do things without understanding. And to me, taking medication, I already felt like that was not something that it helped you mm-hmm. long term or it took care of you. It was just something to get you what you wanted in that. I just felt like taking care of yourself long term was going to be the best way to go. Mm-hmm. I also came from a family who you know, relied heavily on medication, even external family members who, again, it was the same concept of when you have something, go to the doctor, get a drug. And that whole loop to me, just I never understood it. And really, for me, when I finally got into chiropractic, I wanted, like yourself, I I wanted to know it all because I believe information is almost like a drug to me sometimes. Like I can sit and consume (laughs) info and sometimes I'd even need to check myself because I will sit and consume and consume and consume. And <laughs> it's almost like a hit for me to continue to just continue consuming. So for me, when I got into it all, it was so much fun to be able to go around and learn everything like yourself, getting yes. into the clubs. The ones that jumped out the most to me were the ones that dealt with the complexities of things. So I really enjoyed learning things at such a deep level to, to want to improve, you know, patient lives. So that did transition into when I was in practice, I wanted to get into the, the things that maybe weren't relatively offered right away to chiropractors. I wanted to try and, and push myself to get into the integrated settings and work with other medical providers who we still to this day are getting there, but even how many, five, four or five years ago, we were still learning to integrate. Even mm-hmm. just, It's just crazy to say that long ago, it was still 100%. interesting. And we'll get to a lot of the same uh, experiences that you know Doc and I have had. But once I was able to get into that setting, I, I didn't ever want to leave it. I do feel working as mm-hmm. a team with other professionals is always going to be the route that helps the, uh, outpatients the most. But I think today, too, we're going to touch on 
just how powerful chiropractic can be by itself. Yes. So, yeah. With the philosophy <laughs> of what we do, Doc, how would you simply put it to people trying to understand what chiropractic does to the body? Yeah. In terms of chiropractic, that the main thing that we want to do is restore function and to protect the nervous system because yep. we are, our whole body it is almost like a like a machine that we're moving throughout life and throughout years with, but our mind, spirit, that is who we identify as. And it's hard to break apart those two identities because they're so intertwined with one another. So yeah. if you can protect the nervous system, if you can protect the, the mind, spirit, you're gonna be better for long term, you're gonna have better relationships, you're gonna have better surroundings. And what's better in terms of protecting that, it's the spine and how the nerves go out and control everything. If we can influence that for the better, especially how each person's a little different and how you can go about different ways to help heal a person, I think, influencing them via like sleep, environment yeah. factors, nutrition, what's coming into their body, yeah. how is the state of their internal body affecting everything externally. It's just understanding how the body works. And like when we first met up, like I, I knew first off that you were a very, very similar mindset in thinking that we don't know as much as we think we do. However, I think we do know a decent amount. Yeah, yeah. But that we're so curious on how certain things work and that's gonna to lead to never ending education and understanding. Yeah. Those that are listening, we didn't even know each other, but we went to the same school at Northwestern <laughs> in Minnesota. So yeah, small world, but yeah. It's funny how crowds, paths cross, right? Yes, but yeah. In terms of philosophy for you, of how your mindset, has it shifted since you were at school? Are there certain experiences that you've noticed that have swayed certain other decisions moving forward? Or? Yeah. Actually, that's a good question because, yes, absolutely. I had first started out working with a chiropractor before I went to chiropractic college, and he was a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. practice. He had, you know, 12 treatment rooms with, you know, many different therapy modalities in each room. Mm -hmm. So I was able to at least get to see that before I got to chiropractic college. So, so I knew what was out there before actually being exposed to it in chiro school. And I knew what you could work your way up to as far as, you know, adding on different things. And I knew what the, you know, multiple modality clinic would, could look like. And, and I actually enjoyed that model a lot. And so when I went to Cairo school, a lot of the things that I chose to put myself into was just because of the good experience that I had working with Which that makes dog. Sense. Yeah. And before we got to Cairo school, he and I actually did functional neurology training every so often we'd fly to Mississippi and we, we went through an, a, almost the entire curriculum. So I was able to wow. go through functional neurology curriculum mm -hmm. before I even got to Cairo school. And so that is kind of why I put myself more towards the neuro track because I just, I got exposed to it. I really enjoyed the docs that I got to see at these seminars. And I was able to then take that momentum and be like, yep, that's really what I want to do. And so mm -hmm. when I got to Cairo school though, however, things changed. I also got to meet students and providers who did other things and I got excited and I, I kind of, <laughs> I get into this point where I want to learn everything. And so now I've gotten to this point in my life where I feel like I've learned about the profession enough to know, I think what I want finally, <laughs> maybe who knows something might change something. sooner or later, but going through I became a rep for a supplement company and I got interested in more functional Absolutely. medicine versus functional neuro. And then next thing you know, I was working with more rehab based chiros and then I wanted to do just the exercise rehab, <laughs> more like what you've definitely dove into. Yep. And then I finally met someone who told me and I, I really appreciated the advice because he said, you're never going to learn everything. And he goes, a jack of all trades is a master of none. And it really stuck with me because I did find myself knowing everything but nothing at the same time. And eventually I did meet doctors who were doing so well at just doing one thing. Mm -hmm. And I found that they were more successful than the ones who maybe didn't understand that concept. And then just through 
experience, trial, error, I definitely am starting to want to specialize and pick something where I can really master it. And that's now where I've gotten to the point of really wanting to be more neurofocused, focusing on gait disorders and understanding how the complexities of the brain after brain injury, concussion, all that kind of thing. I really think that's going to be a, a path that I will eventually lean towards and go down. And we'll talk about mm-hmm. what that looks like for those listening as far as how does a chiropractor get to that point? Because not mm-hmm. many people even realize chiros can treat those kinds of things. It's crazy. Let alone all the other things that we see day to day. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, that's, that's a really, that was a really good question because I didn't even realize so much of my philosophy has changed over the years. Yeah. How, how about you? Has it yeah. changed for you? Partially, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's... And even go, going back and talking on like, that point, like when we first had certain conversations on functional neurology, I've sat in a couple clubs, talked to a few doctors, but you broke things down quite well. And you can almost see like you have like that knack in the mind to dive into that it's just putting yourself in that setting situation for sure. so it's i yeah i'm excited for you and your path moving forward but i, I think for myself like I, i've seen the structure of just pain clinics and the, the the philosophy of how doctors just want to get patients out of pain and and that fixes them or that cures them right and then i see um, other practitioners actually go into structural correction i'm not a big fan of the word correction like it's almost like if you're gonna fix something there's so many different other factors that can be involved in that word fix or correct yes it's the body's never ending it's always adapting changing for different states in terms of different times of their life yes so i think that's where i find myself more in knowing that understanding of seeing the results of doing small case studies of certain patients trying different things i I see certain things work really really well for this population or really really well for these individuals who are in these activities or undergo this profession like sitting at a desk or other certain things like that that we pick up and i think that's where the evolution of like how the mind and how the body can be optimized to moving forward. Yeah. I think that's where my mind probably will end up going. I absolutely love the function neuro- neurology route, but I feel like I'm going to definitely spend more time on the structural adaptation for, sure. for the performance ha- enhancing optimization pathway. Sure. I would almost explain yeah. <clears throat> your skill set as a physics Oh, dude. Like the way that you can break down Mm -hmm. every single tissue to its cell on what Mm -hmm. can adapt, how the cell or tissue adapts to certain stress, load, direction, change, Mm -hmm. even the histology of the cells in differences to each other versus a certain white tissue, red tissue, muscle. I mean, Mm -hmm. you you have mastered that and really be have have been able to create such a a flow of of practice with it you it's almost seamless for you now where you just know not only how to how to impact each Mm -hmm. tissue whenever you want to but why and that's Mm -hmm. that's an art in itself and too many times i think we forget just how complex the body is being able to be next to a practitioner who understands its complexity. And it's crazy how in a world where if it was, you know, neuros only talking neuro and then body experts only talking body experts, <laughs> we're all still going to get caught up in yeah. the minutia of combo. And we could, we could be talking about two completely different complexities, but mm-hmm. they both exist in the same body. Synergistic effect. And it's, it's crazy how much you can dive one way in learning Mm -hmm. and I can dive one way in learning. And we're still like not even scratching the surface Mm -hmm. on what this body can do. Yeah. And I think that's where the integration and just multidisciplinary may be more advantageous. Yes. It's just because I don't think one person can learn it all Mm -hmm. as much as I'd want to. We'll see how uh, the neuro chip goes with Elon, but (laughs) man. (laughs) Well, and that's the cool part too. It's, knowing what might be in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you for that. It's, 
those very kind words, and uh, I, I feel like I could say so much about the same thing with you, and I, that whole different approach to stuff that we learned in school, but to memorize and utilize the neurology for brain down gives me also a good refresh on everything and also changes my perspective because I feel like if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's the same thing with For sure. stuff that we have in practice, stuff that we've learned in school. For sure. Certain things that like, if you look at how to treat or how to assess the body a certain way, over a period of time, you lose thoughts on other things that could be impacted. For so sure. like For I, sure. I, I, it's I nice to have a fresh that. set oh, of, God, yeah. of eyes and a mind mm -hmm. coming from a different perspective because yeah. we're going to continue to learn and teach each other things yes. that we had no idea about. And that's what's mm -hmm. fun, too, because we're both learners and we love that. So Absolutely. But yeah, hi, Bonnie. <laughs> but chiropractic was founded on this idea that the body heals itself. And we, we were founded on this idea of a subluxation. And I think that's going to be something that probably could be a podcast in itself and people have dedicated their lives trying to understand it yeah and that is what's funny is this simple term this simple word <laughs> has created a profession that has now divided because mm -hmm. of it and now i think we're doing better but for a while i mean it was almost as divided as democrat and republican like i mean mm -hmm the radical forms of each, right? Like the real, you, when you really think about it, you know the radical side of each and those who won't even want to talk to the latter. And it was that point. There has been that point for, for Kairos who, who truly believe one thing versus the other. And it's too bad too, because in my opinion, I'm curious to know what Doc thinks about this, but I think this word doesn't necessarily need to have such a uh, great weight to it. And the concept of the, of the subluxation, in my words, and I'm curious what you think too on this, mm -hmm. is a bone out of place creates change to the body, which can impact our nervous system and create other issues down the road. And Dee Dee Palmer, our founder, really was the one that coined and founded this term. And it's a beautiful term because I think the way that he it, it described it was it was something that not only created pain, but disease with mm -hmm. it and whether that's right or wrong i don't think we have in my opinion the knowledge yet to truly understand what that looks like and i don't know if we're ever going to which is crappy because I, I want to know <laughs> and i want to know the concept my profession was founded on if i'll ever have an answer it's kind of scary to think that it i is. may not in my lifetime mm -hmm. but this concept is a powerful concept and it's one that still pushes who we are and what we do today. And I'm proud of, of being a Cairo and one that can impact this concept. But the way that it's explained nowadays, or even in the past, it's changing for me every single year. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to still figure out what this means to myself and obviously to other people. So Doc, this yeah. concept to you, this, this term, the subluxation, what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. And has your concept changed as you've been in practice of what this means? Yeah, as we, especially as you talk to other medical providers, like let's say medical doctors or DOs, or they they look at subluxation, just that word, almost com, I don't want to say completely different than a chiropractor. But yeah. In terms of subluxations, subluxed, I think about this from their perspective of. Um, either spondylolisthesis, um, where that's pretty much if this was one bone, this is the other of our, our spine, to where the bone, one of which slide forward on top of one another, thus impacting the nerves coming down. Or a retro, same thing, but in the completely opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And yes, those are specific terms related to those in their own right conditions and how chiros look at subluxations which are more of uh, misalignments and fixation and restrictions of bones that are stuck which then impact the neurology so in terms of getting to a state that would un make all parties understand yeah. i think that's 
where it might come over time when more information is presented and that when people have more information out, mm -hmm. we'll have a better understanding. Like we're seeing this now with practitioners, like medical doctors that are in school, they have a, a decent, way more better idea, even since we've been out of school, mm -hmm. of what chiropractors are, what they're able to do. And I think that's definitely going to impact the healthcare moving forward, yeah. in our, not only our country, but the whole world. So yeah, I, I think the understanding of the word subluxation, even when patients come in and see us, like we almost quiz them to a certain extent because subconsciously, if they're aware of where we're assessing, where we're pressing in terms of like the, the spinal exam, they'll have an understanding of, okay, like if there's some discomfort here, maybe there is a part to where the, the bone is fixated, restricted. Yeah. And it, maybe that is what's causing all these other symptoms. Yeah. Which, I mean, we see it for more people than not having results just by clearing up the restriction in the spinal, but also taking that step further and how are the surrounding tissues involved? How is the body as a compensation because of the areas? How is that playing a factor? So right. not only just looking at the small minutia of what is actually happening, like the mechanisms, but the systemic effect from that right. subluxation itself. Right. There's so many concepts that can be brought up from it, yeah. but I think just a general understanding can help people understand that just that can clear up many other conditions yeah. that not many other providers understand, yeah. especially outside in chiropractic. And um, what's crazy is, for me, I'm such a problem solver, and I'm very detail-oriented to the point where I almost... <laughs> get myself in trouble sometimes and when you were explaining that so the way that i think about it sometimes too is do we know all the variables yeah and it's easy to just not want to think about that and just <laughs> assume that subluxation does this and indirectly it might it might cause something that we down this variable path have an end effect due to restriction of the, of the spine. However, I think more, more narrative needs to be added when we're truly as, as researchers or as the, the nitty gritty are trying to understand this. For patients, <laughs> they just don't need to know those nitty gritty details. Yes. And that's, that's fine. I'm okay kind of skipping over all of that just so that they can obviously under briefly understand what we're doing so that it doesn't have to be an hour long conversation every time <laughs> we try to explain what we do. But yes. as a profession, we need to do better at understanding truly what it is because I think it's only going to benefit patients. So when I think mm -hmm. of it, it's almost, yes, does this change in fixation affect other things which might affect patient stress and pain levels, which when they are more stressed, they might have issues with their gut pain in their stomach and then next thing you know they're catastrophizing they're having fear of this pain <laughs> and now it's becoming more psychosocial and now you do have this end effect of not just musculoskeletal but now visceral and was that the subluxation i don't know but That's a good point wow but <laughs> i bet you and how many times have you seen this when we work on that bot, part of the body and that pain clears up and they feel better, those symptoms go away. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a, more of a chicken and an egg conversation, yeah. in my opinion. Which one's the right answer? I don't know. But I do know that I am confident enough to do this every day and use this concept every day. And I know the end effect is going to be 99,999 times out of 100,000, way more positive, and it's incredibly safe, and very rare would I ever harm someone with what I'm doing day to day. Yes, rarities occur where, you know, we get patients that are sore from, from adjustments. That's probably yeah. the most common, but when you're talking rare, 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 it is like a strike of lightning rare. I will go on day to day doing what I do without knowing, truly knowing what I'm impacting, but I don't care because the results that we see 
mm-hmm. make such a huge difference in people's lives. Yeah, and especially when you talk to older chiros, they have such a philosophy and such a, a demeanor to them that there's so much belief that they have that chiropractic adjustment can help heal so much. So just even having that mindset, especially going through school, after school, I know for me personally, gave me so much more comfort in, in treating people. I feel like I didn't know all the answers. I, yeah. I knew a decent amount, but on, on how it can impact them. And then even like what you're saying, how is the, the biosocial aspect of having just conversations of just even before, after the adjustment of this pain, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yes. Maybe that in itself can help heal. Well, right. We've shown it. It has. So when we're looking to do adjustments, not just physically, it's the environment factor. It's what are the sounds coming into their body. The sound frequency can have, to a certain extent, healing properties. Yep. The environment of having a family, of having a place that's comfortable, and having conversations of truth of anything that can impact them whether it's positive or negative that also plays a factor in terms of how that person heals and then the physical path obviously yeah. like the treatment so you combine all those together i feel like that's where we could optimize to a certain extent with our understanding and our knowledge of patient care from a chiropractic standpoint but it's evolution for those listening yeah. Go back and listen to what Doc just said, because I think he just explained why chiropractors are different. Yeah. And that was beautiful. Like, it's our knowledge that there's more to helping people than just what we're doing. Yes. And we need to be cognizant of that. And the way you explained that was so beautiful. It's like, chiros truly understand that not only does adjusting patients make changes to their body but everything else in your life affects your health whether that's external or internal and we know that Mm -hmm. we believe it so heavily and we know there's more to healing than obviously just adjustments Mm -hmm. and the way you stated that was in my opinion probably one of the best i've ever heard and i love that you said that because too many times people, I think, ask what, what we are, and it's so different between every Cairo. Yes. But that was really well put. I, I think people need to realize that Cairos come at solving your problems from a, and, and holistic is an easy word to say, but what, what Doc just said was a way better way of putting it. It's, it's this all-encompassing f- philosophy and theory mm-hmm. that you need to have spiritual, physical, emotional, all of those things in perfectly working order if you want to be 100% optimized human being. Mm -hmm. And pain is only just (laughs) this much of of your worries. Like a lot of people focus their lives on, am I in pain or not today? And if that's gonna make you have a good day. And it's too bad because pain should be a minutia. Yes. It really should. I saw this post actually this morning. It was great. It was, if you go to the gym and do squats every day and you're in pain the day after every day, Mm -hmm. then at least you're not in pain from having arthritis or what have you. So choose your heart. Are you going to be sore from working out and living a full life? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to be sore from sitting there and degenerating and having pain anyway. <laughs> that was cool. I loved yeah. it. I loved it so much. Yep. And I think, uh, <laughs> I think the perspective too really mm-hmm. does, really does give people mm-hmm. a, a different meaning to to what we have here. But yeah. No, that that concept he's <laughs> Dr. Addy put so eloquently that if you choose pain, it's either going to be a pain or a struggle that is going to break down your body or is going to be one that builds you up. It's, you can almost stem it from the origin of stress, good stress, bad stress. Yes. But yeah, no, I mean, hey, man, truth's coming out a lot of this stuff. <laughs> this is kind of the 
kind of cool. Side note too, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, and I, we haven't really ever talked about this. So I had my first Reiki session on Friday nice. with a patient, Melinda. It was, it was an experience. It was a trip and a half. So Reiki, from my experience with that, it was about an hour session long. Lay down, just kind of focus on your breath. There's crystals on different parts of the body related to the chakra system. And she put that as, it's almost like the key that goes into the ignition, which oddly enough, when I was laying there, when we first started, she's like, okay, focus on the breath. If memories come in, just watch as they come out, kind of like a TV screen. But when she put crystal, especially on my forehead, it was almost just like, I don't want to say like this, whoom, but it's, I could tell that there was a different energy that my body, uh, I have never experienced before. Awesome. And then as there's different sounds involved of different frequencies, I'm myself laying there, I'm like, okay, I, I don't wanna keep analy analyzing and assessing the different states I'm in, I just kinda wanna let it happen. And there's different times as she went through the, the session of touching the shoulder, the forehead, the chest and I believe she was putting her hand over the crystal and they're looking at it in terms of moving different energies I don't know to the certain extent of how that is or why that is but there's different memories that were brought up from yeah. me earlier on like th dreams that I feel like I remember having of going into the doctor's office, not knowing why I was there, then going, and then a different memory shifts of uh, my family sitting in the backyard listening to like wind chimes, just just talking in front of the fire, like, and then other occurrences of different colors, shapes, and it, it's weird because it ended with all I can remember seeing was a yellow circle with a hollow, and all it says was "follow me." Whoa. And that's where I, like, I was starting to tear up. I got chills. I have no idea. I sat up. We, we talked about it. I would suggest it to anyone, especially if you, if you don't have the mindset of like, okay, this is all woohoo stuff. I don't believe it. Right. Honestly, I've read about it. I want to experience myself, but I didn't know if I completely agreed with the philosophy yeah, yeah. until I feel like I could argue both sides, but experience it. And the experience was something else, and she was saying that the experience is different for each person, but that just almost speaks to the truth of different other energies that can be playing into the healing of the body. And if your mindset is, like, okay, oh, maybe this won't work, it, it didn't help other people, well, I didn't think that was going to work, and I went home, and I was the mellowest, calmest I've ever been. Nothing really stressed me out, and... It's kind of lasted ever since Friday, which has been a few days. So it's, it's the weirdest thing, but yeah, I don't know. Like when we're bringing up the history of like stuff, I, that just remind me of that whole circumstance. But, I, I, I love energy work. I was not always a fan, not I shouldn't say fan, but I didn't <laughs> always understand it, I think was the best way to put it. And I never was against it, but mm -hmm. I didn't think it was for me. And then I've had energy works mm -hmm. and has I've experienced some pretty interesting things on that table. And so it's cool that you bring that up because mm -hmm. I remember my first session, I remember I, I didn't have that experience. I was sure. same to you. I analyzed everything. I was like, all right, <laughs> what is this? What is this? And I'm sure that does affect your ability to mm -hmm. obviously open yourself up. But as I started to understand it more and more and I started to be around the people that used it and I did start experiencing more and more change and yeah, weird things and what have you. And that's a whole different story of what I got into. But I think we can come back and just state that this body of ours is not only complex, but it's something to be discovered. And you're not going to find it in someone telling you about yourself. You're going to find it in trying to understand it yourself. Yes. And that's where no book or quote or something where you're trying to search for is going to give you. You just really do need to start learning about this yourself. You're learning about yourself by yourself. And 
as I've gotten older, I think that's started to shift and change and being more self-aware and just all of those things that have changed as I've gotten older. And then, of course, meeting other people who's impacted my shift of that too and um, mm -hmm. getting some helpful pointers on where to go. But it all is going to end up with you needing to do that work. Mm -hmm. And so... Experience life. It is. It's super cool mm -hmm. to have this opportunity to live and... I think Gary Vee, I always enjoy when he says that he goes trillion to one, man, yeah. trillion to one. <laughs> you were given the opportunity to steer this vessel however you want, but that's only a part of it. You need to learn about it too. Yeah. And there's a lot to learn about this body and listening to this podcast, you're not going to figure yourself out and you never will from anyone telling you something. You, you got to do that work on your own, but well stated. Yeah, no, I think it's a cool, it's a cool therapy mm -hmm. and it only makes more sense about what we've learned in school yes when you have all those other concepts and, and philosophies uh, coming in with it mm -hmm. so as we're shifting topics to a certain extent because i know we could talk on this yeah. forever like this some of the content we've already just touched on is is brilliant but let's go back to some of the roots in terms of the history like the first adjustment what happened how did that change the direction of where chiropractic was yeah. in the early 1900s to the the 20th century to currently or now the 21st century how does the schooling looked let's have you take it away i think early on we as a profession we were labeled or grouped unified by a gentleman named D.D. Palmer. But Doc, I know you had even found some, some research or history of, of what we do manipulation-wise being performed way before oh, D.D. Yes. found it. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you'll touch on that in a little bit. But <clears throat> D.D. was the first one to, I think, make a unified guess at why it works and why manipulation is so helpful and kind of created not only a philosophy but a profession along with the philosophy and that was chiropractic and this was gosh when was it? yeah 1895 and that was the mm -hmm. starting point of chiropractic and if you think about that it's it's not that long ago it's only over a hundred years ago and when you think about like Chinese medicine acupuncture which has been done for thousands and thousands of years surgery has been done for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. you, you think about the, you know, Socrates and Hippocrates actually talking about medicine and all of those things. Mm -hmm. We're a relatively new concept. We're a relatively new profession. And so mm -hmm. it's just crazy to think like that. And so when you have Didi, whose concept came upon uh, the, the adjustment of a gentleman named Harvey Lillard, who had hearing issues, I believe he was even deaf maybe, I'm not sure to the extent of his mm -hmm. deafness, but um, he had hearing issues and Dee Dee uh, performed uh, a manipulation on this gentleman and quote unquote hearing was restored is really mm -hmm. all I've been able to, to extract from this, this, yes. this experience that happened. And before I move forward with that, <laughs> obviously that by itself sounds almost voodoo and, and strange, yeah. right? But what I think is more important is does, can the body be influenced in a way to, to make this cascade happen where you can overcome conditions, pain, disease, what have you? And there are many ways I think we can bring examples out that makes sense with with what happened on this day and whether or not it actually happened we'll, we'll never no one will know unless you were truly there at the time i don't know but i mean when you think about it and i'm not i'm not religious i'm, I'm not a very faithful christian but i do believe there's a there's a higher power out there and mm -hmm. for those who read the bible if you think about it that way, you, you are following this idea that these things happened in the Bible, but mm -hmm. you were never there, right? And I don't want to turn this into a Christian podcast by any means, but what I do want you to realize is 
there are things that you believed happened way before we, we lived today, mm -hmm. but you believe it. There are just things that we know mm -hmm. without even being able to witness it firsthand. So whether or not this happened, I don't really care. I, I don't care to know the true minutia of what this, this day created. But if he did restore his deafness, that's incredible. And I want to know mm -hmm. how and why. But more importantly, that day gave birth to a concept and a concept that we as chiropractors need to actually take that identity on maybe better than we already have been. Mm -hmm. And that is that the body can heal itself. And now you are seeing other providers take on that identity. Mm -hmm. And if we don't truly lean into that identity, we're going to lose it. And I, I would never want that because it's an identity that I think other professionals are starting to agree with, which is the body can heal itself. Mm -hmm. And so we were one of the, the pioneers in kind of creating more momentum with that concept. And Chinese medicine, alternative medicine, they all believe that too. But we kind of put our own, our own spin on it. And that came from the manipulation of the spine, which impacts the nervous system, which impacts healing. So whether or not, again, that, that day and the outcomes that happened had anything to do with real or, or not, I, that doesn't matter. It's, it was what Didi did moving forward and the entire story behind it and how we as chiropractors came to this final day of getting to do what we do that's a more interesting story, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Oh, yes. And so, Doc, what's some mm -hmm. of the things that you remember learning about chiropractic history mm -hmm. and even before we were even chiropractors? Yeah. How has this evolved in your yeah. timeline as far as what does that look like? Yeah, and going through school, like we, we learn all this stuff. It, it was is something that was in the curriculum to understand our past, but I think they could have done a better job in school to also teach us. Manipulations were done hundreds of thousands of years ago in, in stone carvings and, and how those were de depicted. They stated a lot of which movement of certain body parts restored function yeah. to a certain extent. So yeah. when you look back on Yes, we, we label it chiropractic a little over a hundred and some years ago. Like Doc, you said, and, and my thought process is much the same too. That day definitely didn't matter as much for me because it restored the function of hearing or possibly thereabouts. But it's also going down a path of other areas and other ways to help heat, treat and heal people. And I think... <clears throat> those two between hundreds of thousands of years ago opposed to current state, there's a huge time gap in yep. a lot of information yeah. lost as well. Yeah, but for sure. I mean, Socrates says it itself, if you'd seek health, first look to the spine. Yes. Which, I mean, just even that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so that was one thing. His son, so D.D. Palmer, who performed the adjustment on Harvey Lillard, Didi's son, BJ, which I thought was even better for the chiropractic profession and moved it, accelerated it significantly. Yeah. BJ, he opened up the first chiropractic school, yep. the Palmer School, in 1897. So that was two years after the first recorded adjustment for hearing loss, mm -hmm. even though they've been done in ancient times from the Greeks, Egyptians. Now... That has changed significantly over the, the years. Chiropractors, if they were to practice, there was a lot of scrutiny. There was a lot of oh, this person's witchcraft. Because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that could not be explained. And then you lead all the way into a point right now with the, the AMA, American Medical Association, and how they from the governing body looking at an upcoming profession and how good of results it is with not as much cost to it opposed to big pharma. Yeah. So look at and see who has all the money <laughs> and how is that trying to push down what is working? Yeah. 
that is the difference as the time goes on. So as we're gaining more schooling, as chiros are gaining more experience, more exposure, more results, the AMA almost just wants to push everything down. And there's documented that has come up with that. But I mean, now we're at a point to where we're integrating with other hospitals. But you start noticing a shift over a hundred years and so as we're gaining more knowledge, it makes sense on why this is the third largest profession mm -hmm. outside of uh, medical doctors and dentists mm -hmm. growing in size, yeah. which is it's unreal. It's kind of cool. And that, I know we have the schooling to back it. It's, we, we, in terms of schooling, we look at different topics more than other professions look at other topics. And that's where we can specialize in our own right, but for I think sure. that there's more growing from there. So yeah, for sure. And mm -hmm. you know, you touched on a lot of things. As far as the schooling goes, I'm going to go too deep into it, but we do have just as much schooling as medical residents do. So we do undergrad just like they do. They go through a doctoral program just like we do. Mm -hmm. Now there might be a few differences in length of time, but the amount of credits or curriculum is still the exact same. Mm -hmm. It's just we on top of that have an internship program done while we're in school. They just wait until they're a resident to perform theirs. Mm -hmm. There's really no real other differences with that. You now as far as curriculum goes, we do a lot more, like Doc was saying, heavily more anatomy, physiology, neurology more musculoskeletal based, obviously focused because that's what we are, but we still have to be what are called portal of entry physicians. So mm. we can take any patient who wants to see us without a referral, and it is now our job to diagnose what they have. And when I say it's our job to diagnose it, it's I'm not just saying if you're coming to us with pain, I'm saying if you're coming to us with anything, we need to figure out how to diagnose you. And so we do know how to do orthopedic neurologic tests. We know how to do blood labs. We know how to read and screen for that. We know how to do and make sure to check for infectious diseases. We know how to make sure to rule out anything as far as bacteria, virus. Now, not every chiropractor chooses to practice on that portion of care. There's a lot more that treat just more musculoskeletal, but it's still in mm -hmm. our training to know how to correctly diagnose something when we see it thyroid issues, visceral organ issues, you name it, we got to know exactly how to screen and rule out for those before we move forward with care. Now, do we go and, and manage those cases? No, not every chiropractor does. Some can take on mm -hmm. those cases through nutrition, supplementation, and even other you know, incredible forms of therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, Others that just don't choose to practice that way, we would just refer to the appropriate provider. But it's still our job to know who to send them to and what to rule out. So that is chiropractic. That is a, your chiropractic doctor. And hmm. a lot of people still try to argue that chiropractors are not doctors. And I'm not going to get into it with you because I don't need to, to defend myself. I, I know the capabilities of my training and I think it's only going to be more and more exposed as we continue to integrate with professionals. And they truly do see, in my opinion, such a beautiful way at looking at the, the body. And we can pick up things maybe others can't and vice versa. But schooling wise, that's what separates us from other doctors. And as far as how that's evolved, and I, that's kind of maybe segue into what Doc was talking about mm -hmm. with the AME. I'll kind of work my way up. But, you know, we, in the early 19th century, we were jailed for doing what we, what we mm -hmm. loved, practicing chiropractic. Chiropractors were thrown in jail for practicing. And it's crazy to think that what I love today, doing every single day, and what makes me just so happy and passionate, knowing that I might have the ridicule coming against me for doing what I do, or even a legal unethicalness being thrown in my face that what I'm doing is wrong and knowing that I have to fight that every day that would be awful but just knowing that I might have been jailed for doing what I'm doing blows me away and so it's crazy to think of yeah you have that moving forward into the the mid 1900s we were gaining more and more acceptance but we were mm -hmm. still 
the redheaded stepchild of the, the <laughs> yeah. profession. And I really do think if it wasn't for the cur- courage and bravery of those that fought the AMA head on, we wouldn't be a profession. And so finally to this, this trial that Doc had brought up, if we could create a documentary on this, I think it'd be one of the most watched Netflix documentaries because if someone could have been there mm-hmm. videotaping it along the way and we were truly able, able to capture uh, what happened, it would be it would be one of the most watched doc- documentaries. And so the concept of what happened was we started to understand through agencies, organizations, we were able to capture, I guess, some of the agendas that the AMA were throwing out and creating. And eventually what happened was we were finally able to get them to admit that they had been actually trying to not only contain our profession, but eliminate it. And so this trial started, I think it was 76 and ended in like 86. It was a 10 year trial and it was Mm -hmm. one of the longest trials in medical profession history. Mm -hmm. And during this trial, fighting tooth and nail to try and fight for our profession. And basically they came out and stated that we were trying to kill your profession. We were trying to eliminate your profession. And we even had many organizations, millions of dollars created to try to help to contain it and eliminate it. And it was a a pure attack on chiropractic from the AMA. And it's crazy to think that if they succeeded, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be here today. You and I wouldn't be able to get to get to do what we were doing today. And I'm so grateful that those who chose to stick up for what they did in that time Mm -hmm. created this path now for for chiropractors and this path and down the road as far as how it's evolved i will get to because it is truly a great story as far as what chiros are able to do now versus what they were able to do but yeah i mean to say that we're not still a little bitter i mean we're getting there i think we we've definitely gotten to a point now where even the doctors coming out of school during the same time as we do, they might not even know about the trial. They didn't even know that that had happened. So it's always mm-hmm. important to make sure to never let history repeat itself by knowing it. But, you know, it's funny because I remember when our neuro teacher, Dr. T, mm-hmm. was talking to us. She said back in the day when she was a chiropractor that she had friends that were medical residents. And the first thing day one that they received when they opened their lockers was a stack of papers showing why chiropractic is awful for for people for patients and why you will never should ever refer to a chiro that was in she said the 80s or 70s wow that's what her medical resident friends received day one was crazy was anti-chiro rhetoric they probably didn't even think about any of the other professions they went straight on chiropractic yeah and and we were singled out (laughs) So to have that, just pure hatred towards us, in my opinion, maybe was more of a grooming effect than it was them actually believing it. Yeah. And I think nowadays, not as many, if any, truly have that hatred. Or yeah. some, some, of course, are going to just, are going to have those by perspective or just proximity to what they've experienced. But they're at least accepting of it in certain forms, but maybe not all of what we do. Mm-hmm. But we're getting to that point where we at least are looked at as musculoskeletal first line therapy for at least low back pain to get mm-hmm. started. I mean, there are some other things yeah. that we're still trying to understand, but what were you bringing up before the podcast about you watched what was it, a documentary on some of the people that have fought for the chiropractic profession. It was something about like a, a folder on a desk. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so what th- this was a, a podcast done by Dr. Lewis Fortelli and he is the, mm. the founder of Nick Mick. It's a chiropractic mouth practice insurance. And it was also done by Dr. Arlen Fur, who is the creator of I activator, which is a, another form of chiropractic techniques. And we'll probably get to mm-hmm. that soon. But, he had explained how when he was practicing in the 70s, just some of the experiences that he went through as far as treating patients, coming to the point of needing to refer them to medical specialties, just a big pushback and not having those doctors wanting to at least accept his referrals and saying, we're not going to help you. We don't want to be 
associated with you. And they're just not even, even just knowing that I was able to help figure out what this patient needed and I wanted to get them to the right person. And even my attempt at trying to help them that way was rejected. Would, that would be awful, knowing that I can't help you, so I want to get you to the person who can, and, but they don't like me, so they're not going to take you. Gosh, that would just be defeating. God, and so he had explained just the feelings that he had with that. And eventually he was able to find doctors in other towns to take his patients, but it took a lot of work. He even needed to meet with lawyers and other people that had, I guess, better relationships with those providers to kind of give a handshake handoff. And he said he was obviously thankful that he was able to do that. But in the end, after five, 10 years of practicing, he got into more polit politics. He, he stood up for the profession. He was speaking on it. And he kind of became somewhat of a name, of a voice of chiropractic. And it wasn't until he received this manila folder on his desk, which was a document that explained basically that it was a government document showing that the AMA had created these hidden organizations that had AMA-backed funding to go out and not only contain, but try to eliminate the chiropractic profession. Mm -hmm. And he said at that time when he opened and read it, he finally had some sense of like relief, but now it makes sense. It, mm -hmm. it, it, he was able to get some closure. And from that point on, he used those documents to try to recruit lawyers and eventually he had obviously a big body of Kairos who came together and, and lawyers that came together and they were able to take on the AMA with full force. And after 10 years, the results of the trial was that the AMA was performing antitrust acts to try and become a monopoly and only basically own the medical space with modern medicine type treatments and trying to eliminate alternative med pathways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if those of you who are more prone to alternative medicine, you're probably thinking, well, that makes sense because big pharma and, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it, we're still a little bitter about it and we're still trying to understand where we can fit in this huge sector of healthcare. And I think knowing those stories is important to where we've come as a profession to where we are now and how we've evolved. And I think when we get to that point in the podcast, it'll be fun to, for those of you listening, to know where we've come from to now what we are actually doing as chiropractors. Cause that even might, it might even open your eyes to just all of the things that chiropractors are now doing that you may not have known. Mm -hmm. So doc, anything that you wanted to touch on <clears throat> regarding what you know of the trial and just what, Kind of impact it had yeah no and you say that perfectly because yeah that trial changed <clears throat> honestly healthcare for years and decades yeah, to come yeah and thank god the the people that were fighting for just even conservative care not let alone chiropractic is only going to benefit the health of america which i mean we're still struggling as yeah. a whole like the life expectancy rate is actually diminished. Yep. So I think with more information, better technology, better change of mindset, belief, to where we can almost reverse that to go the opposite direction, to live more healthier, to live longer, to enjoy the time that we have on this earth. But yeah, now that trial was much bigger than people re realize. And it's fascinating that the public don't even know that it even happened, let alone right. Cairo students, let alone right. any other me right. medical providers. So yeah, in terms of chiropractic, just even to dive into the certain techniques, diving into general versus specific adjustments or types of treatment care, because there's providers that will do more of a general approach versus be very, very specific, and mm -hmm. you'll see a difference between those two. Mm -hmm. I know we touched on this briefly, but difference between pain relief, structural adaptation, or neurological base. Yep. So I'll kind of touch on some of the main techniques that chiropractic can have. And going through school, we were taught that there's like over 100 different techniques. Yeah. Thus why all the clubs are there to help teach chiro students as they're going through schooling or for some even after schooling. Very rarely on that, but 
yeah, so let me dive into a few of these techniques and explain a couple small things relating to them. Because when you hear the word chiropractic, they might go to just an activator doctor, mm -hmm. which are, is, if you're listening at home, one of those little clicky machines, handheld devices that can treat a person instead of manipulation through the hands. So there's a technique called diversified. And in order to get licensed, not only nationally, but also each state, you have to be able to be trained and pass a board certified exam test and line up an adjustment without per going through and giving the adjustment. And that's all through the diversified yeah. technique, which most every doctor are gonna have an understanding experience. Some may not do it, some may go down other pathways, but that's gonna be one. The, the other one is, like I said, the little clicker activator method, which when you go into the activator, yeah, it's a small impulse that helps helps treat subluxations. And Doc, in a second here, I, I would love your input on that because um, some people may see different results yes. via manually with their body adjusting someone versus just a little clicker. And then there's other techniques of Gonstead in terms of, and this is where oftentimes if you go in and get assessed via chiropractor and they have you put a gown on and they put this little machine that goes up and down your spine to notice different temperatures and tenicities of mm -hmm. the, the spine will give better understanding of where the subluxations, misalignments, malfunctions are throughout the body. Then there's applied kinesiology, which has more of a, an Eastern medicine type feel to it. It also has more of a nutritional base to where the meridian lines of, of how other body areas affect not only internal organ health, but also how the structure can impact also the visceral yep. body. Absolutely. There's flexion distraction techniques. Oftentimes that is, it creates movement on certain body parts going into the line of correction of how the joints are laid down of the body, oftentimes done in lower back to create a pumping action to rebuild slash heal the discs in between the bones. There's um, craniosacral therapy in terms of addressing the, the cranial faults and how well the neurology of the, the cranium, the skull, impacts the spine, but also on both edges mm -hmm. um, of the tailbone and how they work together with one another. And then there's like neurology based, which I know Doc was stating on that if you can treat other individuals either through eye training or through balance training, yeah. that can impact how the neurology is wired and how your body can adapt and change depending on certain conditions. Yeah. And then there's going to be another one that uh, I do that is a little different that I don't think has been documented, but I, I want to explain my rationale and thinking behind it. But I guess, Doc, going back through some of these other ones, especially activator method, I know you've seen and looked into some re research on if a, someone gives an adjustment, but they don't hear a sound, does it have the same effects? Yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up because that'll be fun to trend mm -hmm. or to segue that to everything too. So we know research wise, when they were able to compare an adjustment that provided a noise, cavitation or audible release, cracking, popping, everything that you hear on TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were able to compare that to an adjustment that used maybe a lower force that didn't create an audible noise or a pop. And they actually showed that there was similar change to the patient's outcomes regardless of the noise being mm -hmm. created. And so what that tells us is it's not necessarily the noise that we need to, to shoot for. It's the specificity of movement maybe, or it's really just the neurology involved of the adjustment. But what's unfortunate is it's very difficult to measure all things involved with the adjustment. And we're still trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But if you break it down in theory, there's a lot of things to the adjustment and we might get to that in a little bit, mm -hmm. but in, Regards to the activator method versus just general diversified adjusting, which diversified is just 
another fancy term for using all of the techniques, but maybe I'll use manual instead of diversified. So a manual adjustment where you, we take someone's neck or low back and we put a thrust through it and it makes a noise or it doesn't. And then the activator technique, which uses this small, almost hydraulic powered kind of mechanism to create a small but very fast thrust of force. And it's put up right against the bone to induce a millimeter or so of change or multiple millimeters or so of change to the placement of the bone, which is exactly what we're doing when we're adjusting your neck. It may sound like we're moving it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. However, it's millimeters of movement that we're actually inducing. So there are studies that show the activator method can actually induce more movement into the joint versus manual. And the concept is that with manually adjusting, we can sometimes have to fight patient's tensions with doing the adjustments versus the activator happens so fast and it's just a tiny click that it can induce more movement to the bone. But I would argue that that makes any difference because we still don't know that there's a certain movement needed to create a therapeutic dose or change to the body. So yes, it may move the bone more. How do we all agree that that amount of movement is actually what's needed? Or is it all of the other things involved in an adjustment that's actually more important to talk about? So when Doc was talking more neurology-based, there's just so many things that encompass an adjustment versus just the movement of a bone. Mm -hmm. And we're talking things that I'm going to touch on, but I'm still probably missing out on so much because there is a lot that I think (laughs) we still don't know. But in general, I would state that there are a few things that it can improve, which one, we do know it can, if doing it manually, can actually create a physical gapping of the joint. And your ability to gap that joint can do a few things. One, if there are small adhesions in the facet joint, which we now have seen on MRI imaging, we can, we're able to at least reduce or eliminate those adhesions, and we can create spacing with the gapping of the joint, which then in turn can create more motion, less pain, what have you. Now, the pain portion of it, though, isn't always necessarily segmented with motion because we do have patients who don't have a lot of motion, but we can improve their pain just by the things I'm about to talk about, which is more neurologically based. Mm -hmm. So when we touch the skin or areas around the vertebrae that we're adjusting, we're already doing what's called mechanoreception stimulus and affrontation. And so when we affrontate, which is just again, sending messaging along the afferent nerves to the brain, what we can do is create stimulatory changes at that level, mechanoreceptively, which then can inhibit nociception or pain, which is why massage works Mm -hmm. the way it does, because mechanorecepting, stimulating the skin, can reduce pain, which is why kinesio tape works the way it does, because when you're putting pressure down on the skin with the tape, it can actually create a a mechanoreceptive mimic and reduce pain. What Doc is saying there, the signal from the body to the brain can change and there's pain that can be either diminished brain down for the most part. Sorry. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I love how you went in depth and yeah. Yeah, no. And, And so really there are so many things mechanically and neurologically happening that creates this beautiful outcome when getting an adjustment. And we still have a lot to learn about the entirety of its effects because we're still trying to figure that out. But in theory, those are maybe the more common things that we can all agree on actually happens after receiving an adjustment. Absolutely. I suppose let's dive right into adjustment, what's happening. Much like what Doc said, Oftentimes, if you go through an adjustment, especially manually getting adjusted and you hear a pop, that releases endorphins, which is what Mm -hmm. feels so good for most people. And 
opposed to just having an active air done where you don't get that release, you don't get that endorphin hit of like, oh, that felt awesome. But like much of the same that he brought up, they're seeing just as good of improvements between those two, which going from the public's perspective, if that education comes in the factor beforehand, I think regardless uh, whether it's placebo effect or not, will improve the the results of the patient, mm -hmm. just knowing that side. But but no, yeah, like kind of like what you said, in terms of how the adjustment is done, anytime pressure is relieved from the nerves, if a joint or bone has been fixated, that will not only relieve the guarding of the tissues around it, but also less compensation as a whole. So when we're looking at the adjustment, we're looking at tenderness, we're looking at tightness, we're looking, is there a change in temperature? Mm -hmm. Is there a misalignment of bone on top of one another? And then there's the joint component. With the movement that you have, the joints, if there's a lot of generation arthritis, the joints can either be one collapse on one another or malformed, and it could lead to friction, adhesions, kind of like what Doc was saying, at the joint level, which for some individuals, if you get adjusted manually, may cause some discomfort because the membrane between the joints doesn't have the fluidity. Yeah. But when you look at the tissues around there, especially the smaller muscles, tendons, ligaments around the spine, if a joint has been fixated, or subluxated for months, weeks, years, there's gonna be a lot of guarding because the tissues are one of the only signalers that can protect the nervous system very, very quickly and for longer periods of time. Yep. When you add gravity to the system, those muscles specifically, there's different properties to them. The tension between the Golgi tendon organs, which are in the tendons and the muscle spindles, which are in the muscles, and how they communicate back up to the brain. Th those are just small changes to the areas of a muscle cell or tendon cell that have communication back up to the brain. But if there's a communication of anything going on in the joint, whether it's the joint, the spine, the hips, it's gonna cause overlying muscle guarding. Now when the muscles are guarding for periods of time, they lose properties known as slow or type one muscle fiber twitches, which are a muscle contraction which is activated for prolonged areas of time. Thus, why we're able to walk with our body just completely giving out. Mm -hmm. Each and every step, it relies on the nervous system to hold the body up against gravity as we walk, as we move, function, sit. Now those with injury are the first to give out. Yeah. So when we go and rebuild, retrain, we wanna add in slow, either small, light muscle contractions, mimicking that effect to restabilize the, the bone structure back up. But if that's, given out then type two muscle fibers, which are the properties of muscles which correlate speed, power, agility, strength, which oftentimes people think, okay, I'm gonna get bigger, stronger. You're oftentimes influencing the muscles to grow in size in terms of hypertrophy or atrophy if you lose muscle mass. But between those two properties, those can be retrained in different ways. So when we're looking back at the spine and a bone is fixated, stuck, restricted for a period of time, there's a lot of muscle guarding tightness um, in terms of neurological tightness. Now when we go in chiropractic wise to adjust the area to try to get movement of the bones to relieve that restriction, the muscles will relieve in tightness to a certain extent depending on how long that's been fixated, if there's degeneration, if there's other neurological conditions. Over time, this is where I think chiropractic mixing in with physical therapy, mixing in with other body mechanisms, professions can correlate and work in unison with one another. Because now as we're getting movement in the joints, as we're trying to correct the spine, as the nerves come out to allow better function, we want to make sure that we restabilize those tissues via specific muscle contractions, specific muscle releases. Are, are we treating the, the tissues passively either due to scraping, due to cupping, or are we having them internally train and having them do the muscle contractions, whether it's 
concentrically shortening the tissues? Is it lengthening? Or are we having them just squeeze isometrically at a specific area? And how's the communication between the nervous system down to the body? And knowing how all those play together can help definitely cause structural adaptation beneficial for the patient to not only get out of pain but in to improve the quality of function moving forward so there is a lot just there but in terms of the chiropractic adjustment we're getting movement in the joints we're affecting the tissues surrounding that area not only locally but systemically in terms of how the body functions trying to get out of compensations to combat gravity and positions sustained over a period of time. And everything works uh, from many different sides. And I'm not even, I didn't even bring up the effect of the immune response right. of inflammation to right. the area affecting that from a systemic approach as well or locally. But yeah, I don't know that if was I beautiful. could, I don't know if I could say it any more broadly, but specific at the same time. No, that was, <laughs> that's the thing is you so try hard. to and Again, it's about as complex as we're making it. But what I think in the end we were trying to say is this simple movement, which creates a simple outcome, has about as, you know, you always see those pictures of the, the tip of the iceberg just sitting out of the water. Yeah. But underneath it is, is this like just ginormously huge iceberg. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I would explain chiropractic adjustment as is, we only see the tip, which is the crack, mm -hmm. the, the, the popping. And that's what most people just associate it with. But we still don't even understand what's the depths of underneath it. Oh, that's and so, beautiful, dude. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what good. I think most people that's good. should take away from this. And so I wouldn't recommend you try to dive into the research and understanding of subluxation. And it, it's, to be honest, there's still a lot that needs to be researched. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is what we do works very well. It works with most people. And the outcomes are generally what we had just explained as far as improving motion, reducing pain, improving function, even strength, tissue change, all those things we do see. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool that we can have that effect just with uh, a simple manipulation. Doc, go into, because uh, I, I learned this from you in terms of what happens when something cavitates or pops. and does that create space in the joint right. or does that just create movement of the joint? Because I think that understanding would be yeah, so and, beneficial. Yeah, and a lot of people, when they hear their chiropractors explain to them how an adjustment actually physiologically occurs or what happens at the cell level, we used to think it was bubbles mm -hmm. in the joint when cavitated, popped, and that popping released gases, nitrogen, I don't know. I've, I've heard it explained so many different ways. And it's those bubbles basically breaking that created the noise. But what we now know is it's not that at all. And you, if you really want to look into this, you can look into Gregory Kotchuk's work of when he took patients and looked at them under a uh, functional MRI, I believe. And he had had this gentleman crack his knuckles for him and they were cracking other parts of the body and basically they were not seeing expulsion of those bubbles they were seeing formation of bubbles and so what they actually found was there was this osmotic pressurized system outside of the joint mm -hmm. and then of course there's a pressurized system inside the joint and when we manipulate the joint in such a way there was this membranotic change where f pressure was actually pushed into the joint and a bubble formed, almost like a vacuum. That's and it, it was sucked in when that pressure changed and that bubble forming actually gapped the joint. Fascinating. Which is why, you know, Z joint or zigapophyseal joint gapping makes more sense now. Mm -hmm. Because when that bubble forms, well, there's that imbibiting pressure of the bubble that can gap almost like if you were to Man. if you think about tracheal surgery when they have stenotic trachea and they put that balloon down there and they blow the balloon to increase the tracheal space kind of similar and 
that's almost as what's going on pressure wise and that's called tribonucleation is, is the word yes it's a fancy word i definitely don't say that to patients I, i'm not out there throwing that term around like like it's something i need my patients to know but <laughs> that concept is actually what is happening inside the joint and we're learning more and more each year about what we're actually doing but it's crazy to think that we didn't even learn that in school yeah you know what i mean when you brought that up that changed like my mind and thinking on adjustments, did they state how it changed the pressure not only in the joint but outside the joint? Did did they say that gas bubbles create also outside the joint and in? Or was I did not in? know. I had have to look more at his work because I know he's doing more and more. I know that you can actually see the MRI in the study of when they gapped it, the formation. You can see mm -hmm. almost little black circles when the joint was pulled apart, enter, and that black bubbles on there was air. And so you got to see that formation of the black bubbles, the black circles. And versus if you put that in reverse, if it was bubbles breaking, you would see the circles first in the joint, and then when it was uh, cracked, those bubbles would be eliminated. But it was actually the exact opposite. That's crazy. Yeah. Man, thank you for bringing that yeah. up. Shoot. And so... To a couple nerds like us who f love what we're doing and mm -hmm. are very passionate about that, obviously it's super interesting to us. But those of you at home, I would just, you know, want everyone to be as educated as possible on what we actually are mm -hmm. doing. And so if you hadn't heard of that before, that's the new running theory on, on what's actually going on at the level of the Man, adjustment. So That's cool. And now, going back to some of the techniques, and I kind of want to explain, I do things a little differently, just based on knowing how the connective tissue around the spine can be altered, mm -hmm. can give insight to either other chiropractors that are listening or other chiro students or physical therapists or anyone that is treating the body's spine. So there's not really a name for it. This is just kind of how I look at the, the body as a whole. In terms of manually adjusting someone, kind of like what Doc would just reiterate there, creating that gas bubble instead of releasing gas from a joint. There's tissues around the spine and how can you adapt those tissues, whether it's them doing certain muscle contractions or you passively doing a treatment on their body or how about a mixture of both. So mm -hmm. there's certain lines of literature that I looked at and how the physiology of the body forms and works. Now when you look at high velocity adjustment of quickly moving in a small area segment to, re to release a pop. There's also another way in terms of, I look at it like slow molding the area, but we can almost slow mold the area to a certain extent to have them do certain muscle contractions to adapt the tissues around the spine to prevent the, the fixation, subluxation that is being stuck out of place but we're doing that from more of a physical therapy tissue standpoint affecting the spine. So we know a few lines of literature, one of which if you may have not heard of a practice called napropathy, it's a treatment targeting just the connective tissue, whether it's ligaments, tendons, mainly or muscles to a certain extent and how that can reheal and regenerate the body's processes. So you look at it from that perspective of them treating the ligaments and tendons, okay? We looked at it from the chiropractic side of manipulation of the, the joints and how does that affect everything else, not only neurology, but also tissues. Then we add in acupuncture, and there's a study they did got with Landivin. If they put an acupuncture needle in a different direction for a period of time, the study they did for 30 minutes, show to induce change of fibroblasts, which are some of the precursor cells which help house and create many different lines of tissue. Mm. Those fibroblasts increase the size in the area depending on the needle and the direction it went. She, the study said it was a bi-directional rotation which helps spread the fibroblast body into a larger sectional area, which just tells me that the body can induce change just by the needle going in for a period of time. You can also look at lines of literature of sustained st static stretches 
from anywhere from two to 30 minutes can induce fasciplasticity or create a lengthening effect of the tissues, which is more from the brain downward, decreasing gamma motor tone, which decreases the, the tension of the tissues, but can create a, a lengthening effect to where you can increase range of motion nice. passively. Now that is different you stretching an area versus you actually stretching with a muscle contraction. Because if you just go into a stretch, and this is where, quite honestly, it frustrates me when I hear, and I, the same situation came up with one, one of my wife's friends, a coworker, talking to a physical therapist. And I'm not bad mouthing physical therapists. It's, there's certain concepts that I don't know if they may not have learned or they may not have put it together. But if you're going to a stretch, and if you're not applying a muscle contraction, which is one of the only ways that the body can send a signal to the tissues of the system, like consciously, the, if you go into a stretch and without a muscle contraction, the tissues will recoil back to what they're used to. If you apply a contraction as the tissues are lengthened, with multiple sessions, they won't go back to what they're used to. They'll stay lengthened and the body was actually gonna be able to functionally utilize that. So let me go back to the adjustment. When we're going back and addressing some of the tissues, whether it's this muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, if you bring the tissues together, that can help de diminish the Golgi tendon organ aspect from the tendons to have less of a guarding effect. And then you have them do a certain muscle contraction in that area or above or below that area, which can help pulling tension to help restabilize those tissues. So you look at that from that standpoint. Now there's what's known as extracellular matrixes. And when you look at how we can he treat and heal scar tissue, which from any injury blow, if there's bruise in the area, that's not only on the skin level, but it's also tissue change below the area of the skin, which can lead to fibrous tissue, which is Muscles, tissues, fascia that aren't laid down properly smoothly, they're laid down in like a jumbled mess, which one of which have may, many more pain receptors in the area, mm -hmm. doesn't have the recoil, which can limit the mobility, the, the function of that area, and how the nervous system communicates the function and can weaker, create compensations. Correct. And weaker, and it's weaker, yes. yeah, okay. Yep. So when I'm looking at treating or adjusting someone, not only do I want to obviously restore function of the neurology, the nerves, either through the area and out to the body, but if there's compensations going on, if there's restrictions of the body, putting more pressure on another area, you have to break apart those two areas of tension via muscle contractions. From there, ideally, you'd want to restore function at that level of the spine also through either light level muscle contractions or specific rehab from a global standpoint or local standpoint to improve the function, but that will require many more inputs that I don't want to necessarily have people rely just on the adjustments, but have them help treat and heal and learn new skills to combat the condition that they have. So as we go through all this, there's that, that technique I'm talking about is certain muscle contractions causing a change of the structure and also small, either like a chisel, like taps or an activator, which can help induce change of fibroblast activity and tissue change, which can also help regulate the tension of how the body can hold the structure up together. I love that. So there would be and that's a broad scope we would have to go if you're as interested into this later probably a whole series video what have you with that just on that topic itself but from that perspective of chiropractic techniques on how there could be more down the road the more we're learning how the body's systems are working one with one another It'll come down to the, the knowledge of the practitioner and how they can utilize different scopes and different referrals to improve that patient as a whole. I love that. Yeah. And the only thing I want to add on that is Please. just something that I think came to my mind when you were talking about that. And that's how 
there's more to what we do than just bones. Tissues mm -hmm. are incredibly important with that. So with kind of a, a general example, I think for people to understand what Dr. Jason just saying would be, in my opinion, it would be like the breakdown of multifidi in the low back mm -hmm. and how that can create weakness, stability issues, which may create pain over time. Yeah. And when we have atrophy of the multifidi, or if we just are sitting for long periods of times and we're not actually exercising those areas and it's becoming weaker. And multifidi is small muscles around the spine. Yep. Sorry. This, yep. No, thank you. <laughs> and those are such crucial muscles for stabilizing the spine. I mean, there might be joint changes too with this happening, but let's just yeah. say, for example, it was just the multifidi. Then what will happen is you'll also get fatty atrophy, which is fat then filling in those mus muscle tissues instead, which you become weaker. You might have mm -hmm. more pain. And the real task at hand is going to be trying to train that multifidi again to mm -hmm. become stronger, where the adjustment not only can improve joints, but one of the maybe only ways, if not other ways, to, to actually engage that contractile multifidi stimulus is through a, a high velocity, low force adjustment. Mm -hmm. But what Doc is also saying is that, yes, adjusting this spine can trigger the stimulatory changes in that tissue, but that might not be it. We might mm -hmm. actually need to break apart and create exercises and or changes to that area to still induce contractile forces and changes so mm -hmm. that you can train it how you want and make it stronger and what have you. And one of the only ways that I can maybe think of an example would be that, but do you mm -hmm. have maybe another yeah. example that no, would make sense for, for I'm glad people? you brought that up. And uh, probably talking more chiropractors, just them, or if you are seeking other chiropractors, if you perform, like let's say, for some people, when we go into adjustment or the chiropractor goes into adjustment, that it can either be, he might not hear a cavitation pop release or there's a lot of tension or it may have caused pain with the adjustment. If you have them or you yourself do a muscle contraction of either pushing, like if you're laying on your back, push your head backwards or chin to your chest or trying to squeeze that area, the body, the nervous system, brain down, communicates the area telling it to release tension. It's okay as long as there's no pain in the area, which you have about a one to five second delay to where after that contraction, you can get the joint to cavitate, release, move much easier. It's just certain things that I've noticed from my experience from when I first started adjusting, which has led to better results. So if you do a muscle contraction, before adjustment, you can get better movement. Nice. So yeah, nice. bias communication top down. Now, I, I think to look at it from a different perspective, and this is where us as practitioners, when we're assessing other chiropractors or other body specialists, general versus specific, will there be a difference between treating the body generally or does it matter to be specific? Yeah. Like, what have you found? Well. I remember when this this came out because it had a lot of the big names in chiropractic that I followed a lot and I really respected. So when it came out, I was truly interested in, and Dr. Kotchuk was one of the oh, sure. the, okay. the authors, <laughs> along with Dr. Stephen Pearl, who again is really what I would consider one of the well-known researchers of chiropractic. And he's a very unbiased voice. And so like I always appreciate someone coming to conclusions without allowing their biases to influence the outcomes because obviously it's very easy for us as chiropractors to unbiasedly state what we do without swaying or infl <laughs> influencing you in a certain way because of our biases. But the study basically showed that when they chose to include clinically relevant information about someone's joint versus not to include clinically relevant information. The differences between the adjustments didn't change the outcome. So let's say someone was having low back pain and the provider would then just go in, turn someone on their side and just push in the area of the low back and adjust it mm -hmm. versus they were given clinically relevant information that they were having more pain in the lower versus the upper portion of the lumbar spine or maybe even a specific segment. Mm -hmm. 
then they would adjust that area. And then they would also compare theories to why that might be, what that might entail. And so it may not always be that case in certain settings, but in regards to this study on outcomes of pain, the general adjustment to the area versus a more specific adjustment had the same outcome. So it was interesting because one, it, it fueled a lot of chiros who <laughs> do believe that a more specific adjustment is something that works better than treating someone generally. And in our profession, it's called the flying seven, where <laughs> it's basically just treating the same five to seven areas that you would treat on everyone who comes into your practice. And there's not much specificity to it. If you think about it, it's treating maybe a couple areas of the neck, the mid back and the low back the same time over and over again, where versus what other practitioners would do, which would be to truly palpate and try to dive deep at each segment to figure out where the problematic area or segment truly is. And I think as practitioners, we need to look at research. We need to understand research as something that can influence what you do, but there's always a grain of salt with research. And that's where a lot of those chiropractors who were maybe fueled forgot to, to understand. And so what it, what it showed was, it indirectly showed low back adjustments help with pain. I mean, they weren't even looking to do that, but they found uh, significant, statistically significant changes in low back pain with adjustments. So I thought that was funny that they were arguing when it's like, hey, we still had good outcomes of this study. But what it showed was there may be more to specificity versus general adjusting than we think. Now, does this study prove that we don't need to look deep to what we're doing as a profession and we can just generally skate by? I would argue that no. because... There's more to this, this, this complex theory of, of practice, and research is only one part of it. You have research, you have clinical experience, and you have patient outcomes. And when you have all three of those together, that's where you need to look. This was only mm -hmm. just one part of it, and there's, it was only one of the only one of the studies that have ever been done. And there's probably more research that needs to be done to truly confirm if this was an appropriate study or not. So... Yes, this study showed what it showed, but take what that how you will. And now you're going to hear from me and Doc's perspective mm -hmm. on why specificity probably matters more than oh. this study realizes. Mm -hmm. And so before I jump into that, Doc, anything yeah. to state before yeah. we get into that? I would challenge the outcome measure of that study. And this is for most all the literature on musculoskeletal health adaptation change, they, they look at the outcome measures of pain, which pain, like Doc said, is only one aspect or one part of the equation. So if we can look at in terms of, does it change cell tissue? Does it kind of like that fibroblast study? Mm -hmm. Does it change the, the function of one person or of something in itself. So I think, God, there is what's known as the Fitz law. It's where they look at change between one movement pattern and another movement pattern. And is there, is that change between the action movement change in terms of time and change in terms of quality against pressure against gravity over time. There has to be better ways in how we are assessing not just pain, not just feeling good. And this is going back to pain relief, structural correction, and neurological base, which we're going to get to in a sec. But I would definitely argue against <laughs> general versus specific via the experience that we've seen from all the practitioners I've assessed and addressed throughout multiple clinics. You see a huge difference in patient results. Yeah. Getting people out of pain is going to be one thing that is also very, very limited. So I'd be curious to see, and I guess I didn't look into this myself, the, the size of the study. Yeah, of course. But when you go generalize to the area, and yes, if we can create change and movement on one area, it can open up neurology, function, 
but it may interfere or impact the areas either above or below that area in which either release cavitated. But let's say, for example, they have scoliosis. Like if you, they have lower back pain, scoliosis is side to side curvature and can have some rotational components to that. If we're adjusting someone generally, going into a convex cave or going into an area where it's rotating into, you better believe gonna hurt like a son of a gun. Yeah. And the results just from <laughs> that lower back pain are gonna be positive, but why that's happening underlying the surface and being as specific as you can gets way better results for way more people, but it also takes a lot more time, knowledge, energy of that practitioner and or that practitioner settings or resources to be specific. And I would suggest if you're gonna find someone looking from a public eye, you wanna make sure they're as specific as possible for the better chance of you spending your time and money and resources to get better. One study is gonna show you one thing. Uh, there's not many done the other way yet. Keyword yet. So yeah. that's my perspective, Doc. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I've found too many times where if I'm not seeing results, mm -hmm. I'm gonna change where I am trying to influence directional, either rotation or gapping with a segment. So for those who are following, we have, let's take low back pain for example. Let's say a patient has low back pain. We have five lumbar segments in a healthy population. Let's say that I felt a lot of their struggles were coming from a aberrant L5 movement. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to impact that in some way, shape or form with either adjustments or what have you. But we weren't seeing the changes that we were seeing and so then I, felt around and felt it was coming from a different segment. We then tried to change there and actually got better results. That has happened more times in my experience than I just never assessed someone treated and got results. I very rarely have had that luck. So for me, it's always, <laughs> yeah. it's always adapting and changing for the patient for me has always dealt better results no matter what. And I do know that from my experience, if my patient isn't getting the results I want, I didn't look further enough or I don't mm -hmm. have enough information yet. I need to dive deeper. Yes. And when I do, I usually find it. And general concept is it's usually a referral of pain from a different area than the actual pain that we're trying to get to. So that's another whole concept talk where, you know, we've talked about in the body series where pain can come from a different area, but practitioners can sometimes get tunnel visioned into chasing pain to an area versus actually treating where it could be coming from. So if you were blindly treating an area of pain and not actually understanding that it was coming from somewhere else, general isn't going to help you. Mm -hmm. Specificity is only going to take care of that issue. So I do agree with you mm -hmm. in regards to that. I also want to know where we can try to gain more knowledge when it comes to this, because I think we need, as the more specific adjusters, more education literature to refute mm -hmm. the current literature that's already out there too. Yes. But I'm not going to, to just let one study change how I practice until I truly have an incredible body of evidence mm -hmm. that would sway my decision making. And I would hope practitioners out there don't just read one paper and then completely change how they think because there's a lot more that goes into uh, managing a human being than one literature or one piece of literature. Well so, stated. I, yeah. I think going back to that study too, in terms of outcome measures, where most of it is all pain based, um, oftentimes just through a questionnaire, after the adjustment, how did you feel, yada, yada, yada. There's better quality studies that can be done, mm -hmm. much like I said. And I think that goes and has a systemic effect to pain relief doctors versus structural adaptation or structural correction versus uh, like a neurology base, all those gel with one another. But I think if you're a chiropractor listening to this, I absolutely challenge you. If you're just looking at pain, you are missing the boat 
completely. Yep. Um, yep. And that's if you're from the public's per eye perspective and you want to go to a chiropractor, you're also looking at it in terms of pain relief. That Very, very rarely do I see someone come in and want to improve function. If so, hmm. it, it is incredibly rare yeah. and I'm super excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Yes, pain is one thing, but pain is only the first part of the equation. Oftentimes, when someone comes in, pain's the first thing we're able to get under control. But oftentimes, if you don't change the structure, pain will definitely come back just a matter of time. Well put. Well put. Uh, then it's the education aspect. Why are you in pain? What is causing this pain? And changing habits surrounding that setting, which is possibly causing the pain and then yeah. it goes into is it causation or versus correlation that's a whole thing itself yes gathering as much knowledge as possible but that's where i think most chiros should absolutely go down the path of structural correction so one doesn't necessarily have to or need to rely on the chiropractor for long term they can if they want they're going to see way better results long term for mm -hmm. the health which i know we'll get into and then there's a chiropractor in terms of functional neurology so doc your perspective pain structure relief versus structural correction to the neurology base obviously they work together in one but what have you seen with other chiropractors with other medical professions the the public's eye and where do you do you see this moving forward optimally yeah that's beautiful to put. I would first like to state that I agree with the whole treat only pain concept is not the right way to go because the way you had said it was great, which was if you don't look to impact the other factors, that pain just going to come back. Mm -hmm. And so that's already something that I know we've talked heavily on in this podcast, but I do agree with that. And I think as far as where it's difficult for providers to sway is because they're paid heavily on pain. Pain pays the bills. Pain is going to be most people's primary motivators. Well, let me rephrase that. What they think is their primary motivator that's, yeah, that's well to stated, bring someone yeah. into the clinic. Now, stated. what they didn't realize was that their primary motivator probably wasn't pain. It was what the pain changed them from doing. And that's where a lot of people forget. And so that's why function and those other factors and that's why that's why chiropractors are different because we try to get you to think about the other things that pain's affecting. So is pain really your issue, or is what is it? What was the pain changing in your life that made you want to come and see us? And I know for a fact, getting rid of your pain is only a part of it. There was mm -hmm. something that you experienced during your day that you didn't like that the pain changed that made you think, "Darn it." I need to go get this looked at. Now, subconsciously it might have happened and you didn't actually recognize it. But if we actually break apart some of the things that this pain has been making you do differently, we will get to the primary reason that you came in to see us. And many, many, many times, if not all the times, it's not just pain. It was the fact that you couldn't go golf it was the fact that you had to sit there watching someone else play with your grandkids because you weren't able to get down on the ground and play with them yourselves. You know, it was that you had to cut your road trip short because you couldn't stay in the car long enough because it hurt so bad. It was these things that you maybe don't pick up that truly did change something for the worse. Mm -hmm. And pain was the reason behind that. So Yes, pain is incredibly important as providers to understand. And I think pain science by itself is a, oof, it's a beast. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's going to be very difficult to try to understand even as we've, as we've come along so far with it. But there's a lot more to pain than we have already understood and there's more to learn. But when it comes to pain, pain is just a signal. So another thing that's what people need to realize is pain came about because you had been doing something wrong long enough for that signal to be created. So <laughs> That's good too. here's another thing to think about. It's all right, let's, let's take a look at this analogy. And I love this analogy because I think people truly grasp it once I, I explain it this way. So let's call your body a house and let's mm -hmm. call pain fire. Ooh. Now let's say you have 
an absorbent amount of pain which burns down your house, okay? Now, pain is the fire. Let's say the things you're trying to do to get better are the firefighters who come in and extinguish the flames, okay? That pain is now gone. What are you left with? Are you left with the same house body that you had? Or are you left with rubble? Now, there are times where you only burn a little bit of the house off. And there are times when that house comes f crashing down because of the extent of which you put yourself through. Now, pain is only a certain part of that and so are the flames. Now, the firefighters are gone. The flames are gone. But the damage has already been done. And it's function and structure that Doc's talked about mm -hmm. that's so important to keeping a problem from re-arising. So that's where I think more people need to really understand what happens when we have pain. It's not that pain, when it goes away, you're left with the same structure that you had. It was structure like maybe faulty electrical wire that started it in the first place. Or it was, you know, an external thing, which was a grass fire that came in and actually started it. Oh, I bent down and right. hurt my back. Why did that happen? Right. So there's something underlying that caused it. And it was probably happening for a lot longer than you thought for the flames to first get started. So structure is going to be such a crucial part of this. But not all only structure. There's, there's more to this analogy that I'm trying to maybe create, but... You know, you talk about the body, you have, you have mental health, you have spiritual, you have emotional, you have physical, you have just all of these things that can implement change to this house. And pain is just such a small part of your well-being. And too many times it gets put at the top priority of what you feel as how you perceive yourself as healthy. So if someone who continues to think they're not healthy because they have pain every day, they're going to continue to push themselves down a path of catastrophizing and feeling not the best. And they're going to start to doubt themselves and they're going to start to have all these changes. And next thing you know, they're in pain every day. They're weaker. They're not doing the things they want to do. And then they call up someone for help who can maybe manage that pain. But they're stuck with all of the things that brought them down that path in the first place of being weaker degeneration, all, what have you. And if you don't start to impact that part of your life, the pain will always come back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I stand on that. And as far as neurology goes, the concept of pain is only another part of neurology. As far as function goes, neurology is everything. When you are contracting the muscle, it's a neurological stimulus that, through an action potential which helps you do that messaging to heal is done by the nervous system and brain itself. So when you talk about some of the cool things that functional neurologists are able to do, you talk about, I mean, that might be a whole nother podcast to be honest, yeah. but in, in just general concepts, when we have a breakdown in communication, we can actually retrain that signal through certain actions, exercises, and through neuroplasticity, which is just a term meaning our brain's ability to create new connections by via stimulation of it, can actually happen. And so let's say you have a head injury and you have a certain dysfunction now with what part of the nervous system, whatever was impacted. There are things you can actually do to retrain that nervous system to regrow and or change its neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. That's functionality in a nutshell. So how chiropractic ties into that is the adjustment is another beautiful way to impact that nervous system mm -hmm. and okay. everything else we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So I come at it from a root of changing things neurologically because I do feel like that is such a root to the body. Um, whether or not it might be coming from something else, is uh, there's always perspective and, and, and influence of thought. But really when you talk about the growth of a fetus to its, itself, uh, as far as being an infant or human, you have the notochord, which mm -hmm. is basically the entire beginning process, which then first forms. And in order for your body to become the actual formed fetus, the notochord, which contains all of the information 
and a nervous system to begin with, that's the starting point of histology in a way of, you know, embryology. Mm -hmm. So we can argue all day and night, obviously, of what is better. But I do think that coming at it from a deeper dive of understanding this body is only going to benefit patients in the long term. And when, when listening to that, a huge thing that came to my mind is the psychology between a male and female. And we typically see females. Now, why is that? Going from the, the pain side of things, people usually come and see us just due to pain. Yeah. When we look at it from male versus female, females in general have a better awareness and understanding of their bodies than men do. And I think a lot of that will come from if you're the man in the house, that you have to fight for your family. You have to put your well-being behind everyone else. For sure. And I I think that's where, let's be smart about this. Let's, if there's pain going on, if your house is burning down, but your other family's houses are burned down, you want to help put theirs down. What if yours is way bigger and worse and they just have a small little flame coming off the stove or something like that? Yes. That they that that person may perceive, if yours is on fire, you have to get yours under control. Like you can't toughen this one out. And if you do, this is where we see it multiple times throughout so many people, and it's more times worse than males. That the body leads to to degeneration. The body leads to wear and tear much sooner on, mm-hmm. which is also why I believe that the female life expectancy rate is way higher than males. Yep. Just due to that concept but i really like that house fire dude that is such i was listening to this i can't wait for you to break that down in a short form content and (laughs) put that out that was good that was really good now i guess in terms of chiropractic we hear this often if i go to chiropractic i'm gonna have to go for the rest of my life for sure yeah you necessarily don't have to but do you want improved function? Do you want better communication of your nervous system out to your body so you're not in as much pain? And I know you have a couple things, Doc. I'm very curious to hear, but I think my two cents is there's only going to have favorable outcomes if you do go, whether it's you, know, you create structural adaptations that you want to maintain or certain small areas that you want to keep getting better at. Maybe not go at the frequency, maybe back off the frequency and work on body systems and those things at home or in the gym or with a trainer or, or other medical professional. But it's all about there's good stress, bad stress. Good stress is something that can build the body versus bad stress, which can break down the body. Mm-hmm. So, Doc, going for the rest of your life, what, what would you tell patients? Well, I think... Before I answer that question, I do want to state this for patients or just even those listening, which is if the chiropractor isn't listening to what you want as a patient, then we're already doing you a disservice. So here's, here's where that's, that's already the, the starting point of this argument for a lot mm-hmm. of people. So. You hear that, oh, well, well, I have to come so often for so long and then I have to keep coming and like all these things. And there are, unfortunately, have been experiences like that out there for people. And, and, I'm, and I'm sorry for that because there are things that could definitely have been done better. And there are concepts that I think providers should adapt and bring upon when they are practicing. And so that might be a whole other argument in itself. Mm-hmm. But... What I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of confusion with patients and chiropractors. They were expecting one thing and then they received another. And that might have been, they were guaranteed that they can help with their pain, but they were given this completely different solution than what they were expecting. And maybe they had thought that you could adjust this once, twice, maybe three times, and I would be out of pain. And oftentimes that is the case. We, there's a good chance that if we treat you a few times, we're probably going to make an impact to your life, pain-wise, for sure. Now, if you come to us wanting to actually adjust and change the structure that we talk about and reduce this pain, even keep it away for many years at a time, I'm sorry, but three adjustments isn't going to do that, let alone one. Now, what is it going to take? 
it's going to take everything that you've heard, unfortunately, which is multiple visits for a length of time to try to create that drastic change that we want you to have, that you want to have, so we can prevent any serious you know, changes in, in the future from, from ever happening. And that's where a lot of people would disagree. But too many times they go to the easier, maybe path of least resistance provider who says, yeah, no worries, I can get you in, we'll treat you and your, your pain will be gone. And next thing you know, that pain came back. Mm -hmm. And their idea of management is, I'll just wait till the pain comes back. I'll go and see you, good, and then I'll go. I'll just go until the pain comes back. And maybe it's a once a month, I doubt it, probably once every three to six months. Oh, I fixed it. And your idea of fixed or managed, in our opinion, is wrong. Because what we know is those that do that end up in our office and we do the actual deep dive to figure out what's mm -hmm. wrong with them and they don't truly realize how horrible their body has degenerated to or the kind of underlying problems that they've had because their idea of manage was misconstrued by a provider in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So yes, do you have to come see us multiple times a week in the beginning to make a change, yes. Just as though you were gonna try and make a, a lifestyle change going to the gym, would you actually make a change doing it once every six months, let alone once a month? You're not gonna see the changes that you want. And the body's the same way when it comes to what we're doing. It takes multiple times a week to get the neuroplastic changes in the brain that we talked about, to get the structural integrity changes that we talked about. Pain will go away very shortly when we start doing what we're doing. But when you come at it from a point of longevity, you're going to get such better outcomes in the long term. But too many times patients are just not that patient, pun, no pun intended, to, uh, to wait out for the changes. And unfortunately, that amount of treatment can sometimes be have financial means and it, it, it's unfortunate that insurance doesn't cover what we do to the fullest because what we do really does make a change in a lot of people's health so I think I answered that mostly that's good what I wanted to add in towards the end of that was the the actual research behind what we do from a multiple visit standpoint and there was a study that was done called the Nordic Maintenance Program. It was a great study, and it showed that over a 52-week period, they did basically took a cohort of people and gave them treatment in just a small sector of the year. I think it was either a month or two. Mm -hmm. And then they let them go the rest of the year without treatment. Versus after that next cohort, cohort did treatment, they were actually adjusted on a maintenance type visit, whether it was once a month or I can't remember how many visits, but they actually were given multiple visits over the length of the year after care was finished. Now this was after your goals were met and, and pain was reduced and what you wanted out of care was achieved. But what they found is in the first cohort who didn't have that maintenance had worse outcomes long, long term. Mm -hmm versus those that were actually trying to maintain it had better outcomes. So what does that tell us? It tells us that do you have to come to us the rest of your life? Well, I don't like the way that's phrased because it makes it sound more negative. It's like, yep. do we have to come and see you? And it's like, no. But for you to feel like that's a bad thing, in my opinion, is already we did you a disservice mm -hmm. because after care, we would want you to think that that's necessary, that coming to see us is an important step in maintaining this issue or just your general well-being. I don't want us to feel like we're the dentists that call you every six months to come in and drill into your teeth. I want us to be an environment and a setting where you can come and do great things, have fun, and optimize your well-being and I think someone would want to have that every month or 
they would at least want to continue to have that amount of health and wealth in their body over a long period of time. And that is the way that I think people should think about it. So do you have to come and see us? No, I don't care what you do. Unfortunately, I can't convince you to care more about yourself than I do. That's beautiful. So the way that you are going to manage yourself is going to be up to you. I'm not going to try to convince, sway, or persuade you any other way because that's not my job. My job is to educate you, give you recommendations, and tell you that the more you come and hang out with us, you're probably going to have way less issues and have more longevity and function in your life. And I will stand by that statement. Now, mm -hmm. do you need to? Want, you know, do you have to? Those are words that I think change your perspective of who we are. Mm -hmm. So in the long term, should you see a chiropractor for your entire life? I would Why as a not? chiropractor. I would want to have these tools available for all the things that I want in my life. But if you, you don't have that kind of you know, aspirations for your lives, then, then don't use us that way. That's, that's up to you. Mm -hmm. But for those of you that want to maintain longevity of your body, you want to continue to have the ability to do the things later on in life that give you, you know, vibrance and love and fulfillment, we are going to be a great resource for you. That was well stated in all fronts. And God, I definitely encourage you to re-listen to that section. Gosh, probably this whole podcast multiple times. Yeah, it's, I like how Doc said it as well. And have to and should is what you perceive the value is of just overall health. But I mean, if you don't have your health, what else do you have? Because then True. everything else is going to start bogging down True. on you. And that's going to affect mentality, friends, family, your purpose in life. So yeah, better, we saw it with the study, better results long term. Now, I think this also makes sense on what is the stress that your body goes through. So like, for example, we're adjusting people different ways multiple times on a daily weekly basis that will change on the maintenance and treatment that you need to maintain or for us to maintain that is long term so like i know for example i have to be adjusted at least once every week once every other week for myself to be maintained properly that might be different from a school teacher that might yeah. be different much more from like a construction worker yeah so what are the demands placed on your body and how is the body maintenance specifically related to you and your age, your gender been affected? And that's different for every person. Great point. So, that was beautiful. Great yeah. point. And like, you know, like we had stated, uh, it, it may be different for you. Mm -hmm. You may just not need that kind of uh, stimulus for what you're trying to achieve with this body of yours. And mm -hmm. that's okay. If you want to sit and argue that you don't need that, Go ahead. Like we aren't saying that every human on earth needs to see us every day, every week. That's not what we're saying. But yeah, no, I think that was really well put. Oh, that was beautiful. So as we go into the pr profession and how it's evolved, what are some turning points from current present moment to the future? Doc, what are a few things that you have seen and are excited for moving forward into the future? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people that maybe don't understand even where chiropractors have gone with even in the past <laughs> five years, 10 years, even in the last year. But uh, I'll do my best just to try to give you some perspective of some of the things that chiros can do and are doing as we move forward here in the 21st century. But we already have the ability to specialize in other, I guess, levels or certifications there are many things that chiros can can add to their repertoire of tools mm -hmm. you know we can do more rehab focus we can do acupuncture we can do neurology we can do you know in oregon you can practice minor surgery That's you can prescribe meds <laughs> in in certain states there are just the scope is ever changing and we'll see what that looks like moving forward and there's going to be pushbacks because we as chiros are very passionate about what we do and we don't want too much change in the profession, which again, can maybe go back to philosophy between certain chiros versus others. We don't need to get into that. I feel like we've touched on philosophy enough today, but mm -hmm. what you'll find is the ability to, to obtain what's called a diplomate is similar to an MD being able to either be a 
ophthalmologist or a EENT specialist or a urologist or a surgeon or they can go and do a specialty, which mm-hmm. is similar to Cairo's. We get to go and do a specialty if we want to. It's just, again, further postdoctoral training so that we can test and have the certif- sort of board certifications to, to have that diplomate. So maybe the more common ones are chiropractic internists who actually become almost similar to a, a medical doctor internist where they look at the, you know, the visceral organs and they try to diagnose those kinds of things and use certain treatment therapies to help with that. Functional neurologist or chiropractic neurologist is, is one that obviously we touched on today. Chiropractic radiologist, who some of the chiropractic radiologists that I've spoken to and I've seen, they are so advanced as far as reading imaging and sometimes, in my opinion, even better than other radiologists. Now I'm not going to put that and pin them together. But what I'm saying is the training that they have really does give them quite an advantage in reading imaging. And we as Kairos can send our images to them to be read and give a better perspective of what's going on. And I love being able to have that. You have chiropractic orthopedists who maybe do more orthopedic involved things. You have sports physicians that CCSP is, I think is what it's mm-hmm. called, who can do more sports related chiropractic. You know, functional medicine actually was one where I wanted to add, which was the ability to further educate ourselves on blood lab analysis and do supplementation and nutrition and those kinds of things. We get to have that as chiropractors, as as doctors, and maybe not a lot of you realize that we can further advance our specialties too. So, and some of those providers are friggin' geniuses, like that can go on and and add another few years of studies to their Mm -hmm. already, we have close to eight years under our belt to think I got to get into the decades to be another specialty. I mean, that's a lot of work and it's a lot of studying, a lot of training. So yeah. And even like for animal chiropractors outside of our species, like I know I take my pups to animal chiropractor and you you see some incredible results. And now we're seeing that animal chiropractors or even other veterinarian specialists are going into animal chiropractic and working that in to the veterinary clinic as well. So that's another that's awesome. change that's been happening. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that because sports. when we are able to only further advance our knowledge from other providers, that's, again, just something that we can use to push push forward. And that's, mm-hmm. that's great because what's funny is people don't realize is if it's been done on a human, it's been done on a horse. Yeah. Like horses are the, usually the first ones to get treated with new upcoming technology. Shockwave therapy, for those of you who don't know, was tried on equine way before it was tried on mm-hmm. humans. Yep. And it's just, it's just cool to have that. So we've talked a lot about chiropractors working with other professionals. I don't need to touch on that. I think yeah. we've done a good enough job. We're starting to become more greatly accepted into the population. You know, and I remember back in Cairo school when the Mayo first put out a ad for a chiropractor was really a turning point for me and I really felt that we were going to be changing and this was going to be something that never what I had to realize we were getting into this point and it was fun to see that because within that two or three years after the Mayo posted that there was a chiropractor in every hospital because the Mayo had done it and so it was such a great turning point for chiros to be able to integrate themselves in the huge hospital settings and now you go on any big hospital website, you're going to find a couple of chiros in, in the system. So mm-hmm. to be able to have that opportunity to go work in a system like that is great. You have the VA residencies that are open for a lot of chiropractors, and that's such a huge population that needs chiropractic as military, veterans, what have you. I've treated a lot of veterans in my life, and we, I came from a, a population in Minnesota that had a lot of veterans. And so I've just seen the struggles that they've seen. And what's unfortunate is just the of lack of care that they are given and, and it's really unfortunate so i only want more chiropractic coverage for them i only want more ability for them to see chiros because they are the ones dealing with a lot of pain among other things that are going on so there's that we're seeing like doc had mentioned before we're now the third largest medical profession in size other than mds and dentists so i didn't even know that oh, that's unreal that was something that blew my mind. More research is now being done on this profession. We're seeing, we're seeing more and more research to back what we do, which I think is needed. 
-hmm. We absolutely need that. Yep. We, we need to be able to speak with other professionals and show that what we've done is being researched because it's an important part of healthcare. The University of Pittsburgh now has the first public university doctoral program for chiropractors, which has never been done. Wow. Normally, for those who don't know, you have to do un undergrad and then you have to go to a private college somewhere mm -hmm. versus getting to actually stay in the public system. And there are a lot of advantages staying in public universities because there's a lot of scholarships. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of just incredible amounts of wealth and donations to public universities that we can then get to tap into resource-wise. So that was huge. I know of a lot of colleagues of mine who sit on the boards of medical settings such as neurologists, surgical centers, pain centers, and other you know, practices other than chiropractors. These are chiros getting to sit on the Department of Neurologies. You know, they are the ones running surgical centers. It's so exciting to be able to get the authority that we know so much that we can actually be of value to those other professionals. It really does give us a seat at the table, which I think we finally are, are being given and, and deserve. And then I just know recently I was reading that the joint, which is a billion dollar franchise of chiropractic, you know, gave a $250,000 scholarship, which is about a paid in full tuition for, mm -hmm. for becoming a chiropractor to, I think it was Logan. So now in private settings, you get to see a, finally a full scholarship going through. When I was in chiropractic, I'm <laughs> sure Jace even can agree, we didn't have that benefit. It, there was no scholarships. If anything, it would be very, very minimal. Not as much, yeah. And so to be able to fight for a fully funded scholarship, that's everything. I mean, we should deserve to uh, fight for equality in what we get to do as far as medical professionals versus others, you know. I remember lobbying in D.C. on what was called the, the PSFL Act, which mm -hmm. was student loan forgiveness if you worked in a rural area. Chiropractors are still, fortunately, still, mm -hmm. after I lobbied, it didn't go through, still the only medical professionals who don't qualify for student loan forgiveness. It's unreal. Yeah, it's unfortunate. We, we don't get that ability mm -mm, to. Not yet. Exactly. The bills are trying to get passed. We're trying to do our best mm -hmm. to push this through. There was supposed to be a v chiropractor in, in every VA hospital by 2020. That bill was passed. We still aren't seeing that because of funding. Like, mm -hmm. it, it, There's just so many things that I think we're still moving towards and looking towards as far as the future goes. So we're going to get there. But how about you, Doc? What have you seen as far as changes through, the, through even just as being in pr mm -hmm. practice? Yeah, from my perspective, looking from a broad scope, not knowing, well, now knowing all this is going around, and I didn't even know half of this stuff in the last, like, five years. Like, we learned some of it in school, but I, I think also with more changes, it will come from the integration with other providers uh, and their acceptance, which has changed twofold. Even students in other professions, whether it's medical professions, um, neurology, they're being taught... I think much more of what other professionals, other disciplines can bring to the table. So I have seen an improvement in terms of the openness of newer physicians yep. and wanting the best for their patients. And, yep. and that's where I, I tend to work better and favor more of the younger physicians just due to the openness. So we don't have to go into that barrier, which we've been through for decades. Good long. point. I love that. Yeah, that's a great um, point. But there's still a lot that needs to be changed. There's a lot that we as a whole, especially as chiropractors, need to open ourselves and need to be willing to improve on. And I, th I think that's where if we can lead by example, if I can lead by example to a certain regard, showing it can be done and others will follow suit to a certain regard, I, I think that's where the impact that we slash I can be made in terms of future development and also helping the associations, the, the boards that are inducing change to help bring as much coverage to the profession, yes. to help bring the, the care that is needed and the education that is needed for not only for America and the public, but also for the, the world and, and also for generations to come to benefit 
the the human race. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah. A great point, Doc. And to kind of cap it off, we now have such a, a great body of research to really solidify what we do. You look at the Lancet studies, which came out and really just showed that back pain was really mismanaged in the last decade through overprescription of opioids, pain management, painkiller, excuse me, and just how that first line of treatment should be chiropractic care, PT, exercise, ACU. All of those things should be first in line with not only low back pain, but musculoskeletal pain, in my opinion. It was just on low back pain, but it transfers over to all musculoskeletal pain. Mm -hmm. The WHO finally came up with a 276-page guideline to managing low back pain. We were absolutely mm -hmm. included as first line of therapy for you know managing low back pain. There are just a lot of things that are coming out and it will continue to come out showing the efficacy of what we do, mm -hmm. how safe we are, and why we should always be included in the first talks of managing your pain. So yeah, that's Beautiful. that's kind of what I have as far as uh, the promises of our future doc. Is there anything you wanted mm -hmm. to touch on before we finish up here on just what the future holds for this mm -hmm. profession in your eyes? Yeah, I see that there's a change needing to be made I see that there's a lot of potential in not only our profession, but also for the healthcare. It's just going to take time, funding, resources. But I, I challenge you, if you're still listening, if you are not a chiropractor, or if you're just in the public eye, I would strongly suggest going see a chiropractor that has experience, that is willing to listen to what's going on, whether you're in pain or not, just to experience the, the benefits that you are missing on that you have no idea even about yeah i can't encourage that more strongly enough and just watch how things will change not only physically in your body but mental state if you have had bad experiences in the past maybe try a different chiropractor or a different chiropractic setting that that might benefit you more as well yeah. um, i wouldn't try to close off completely on the, the chiropractic profession. Yeah, that's my two cents. Perfect. Forward. We, we live in a world untapped to the rest of the population. And mm -hmm. I think the same statistic I hear is about 10%, which is crazy to think. It is. Because in our world, we think everybody sees us. But to think that there are 90% of you out there that still haven't seen us, just blows my mind. I don't know. It really blows my mind. So mm -hmm. I just, like Dr. J said, would encourage you to, to, if you haven't see one, there is a world on top for you here. And I can only be excited for you mm -hmm. to try and go down that path because I am not going back. I, I only mm -hmm. want this path for myself, for my family, for my patients. I truly think this is the best way to manage your health care mm -hmm. all around. So yep. agreed. Yeah. Cool. All right. That was our incredibly long take on our profession, which <laughs> I'm going to argue. I don't think I've ever even heard of a podcast like this being done on mm -hmm. our profession. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, we Not really, depth. no, we really dove into it all. And there's, what's crazy is there's more to still dive into. I mean, that's, yeah. just, <laughs> that's just how that goes. But for those of you that mm -hmm. watched, thank you so much. And please just comment any questions you have, please let us know. We would love nothing more than to dive deeper into this and just to give you everything that maybe you missed or you want us to obviously break down into short form. Just please let us know. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts to continue to subscribe and like and share our content. We really do appreciate every single one of you. So um, with that, Doc, Woo! another one. We'll see you next time, guys. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us on The Functional Code. For more evidence-based health insights, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Remember, your journey to a healthier you begins with understanding The Functional Code. Until next time, stay well, stay informed, and embrace the science of living well.